Hello there. My name is Brett Palmer. I'm a third year student at Eden Theological Seminary here in St. Louis, and I'm also the licensed pastor of St. Peter United Church of Christ in Centralia, Illinois. And I'm here just to provide some uh, opening reflections as you begin your study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians is one of my favorite of Paul's letters. First of all, because it gives us a great sense of Paul's pastoral style. Uh, it becomes very evident as you read the body of the letter that this is probably not the first time that Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And it gives us a sense of how Paul regularly used letter writing as a way to project his presence uh, back in the communities he was no longer with. It was a way he could continue to pastor them and guide them and teach them even after he was no longer present. In this particular letter, Paul is responding to a letter he's received from Corinth uh, that was asking him some questions about some, some of his teachings. And it, in an interesting pastoral move, Paul delays uh, answering any of their questions of the letter. The first six chapters of the letter do not respond to any of the Corinthians' questions. Instead, Paul takes those first six chapters to address some gossip that he's heard about some not-so-good things that are happening in Corinth, about some factions and competition that's emerged. And it's not till chapter 7 that he then turns to consider the questions that they've written to him about. The other thing that I love about 1 Corinthians is that it really gives us a sense of just how radical Paul's understanding of the gospel was. But we'll miss that if we don't know something about the history of Corinth, about the history of the community he's writing to. So Corinth was one of many cities uh, that Rome sacked in the course of its many wars of conquest. And when Rome sacked the city, it killed all the males and enslaved all the females and children. And so the city was left abandoned. It was about a century later, Julius Caesar resettled the city uh, with urban poor from Rome, many of whom were recently freed slaves. And what this set off was a, a, a hyperactive competition for wealth, honor, status, and privilege within the Roman imperial system because for the first time, or at least the hope that was held out for the first time to these lower classes from Rome, was that they might actually be able to uh, find some upward mobility. They might be able to work their way up in the Roman imperial system of privilege. And so it sets off this hyper-competition for access to wealth and status and power. And of course, Rome is totally happy with this, as, as most empires are, because it keeps the lower classes distracted, fighting among each other, and never really questioning the Roman imperial system itself. And one of the critical things to keep in mind here is, of course, in the ancient world, one of the markers of your access to wealth, status, and privilege is the ability to be educated. So the ability to receive an education, to have the leisure to pursue an education and to afford it, and therefore to gain in knowledge or to be known as wise was something that would be an indicator of your wealth and status and privilege. And this becomes especially critical to keep in mind as we turn to, for example, your first focus texts, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul talks especially about how the cross makes foolish the wisdom of the world. Paul is taking aim there at members of the Corinthian church who have continued to be engaged in the system of wealth and status and privilege and probably have access to education. So when he talks about making the world's wisdom foolish, the cross making the world's wisdom foolish, he's taking aim at that entire system of wealth and status and privilege. And he's effectively saying that by participating in that system, Corinthians that do so are participating in the same system that crucified Jesus. So he takes aim and criticizes that and tries to remind them in that programmatic opening statement that by following the crucified one, they're called to a different way of living in the world. This is also critical to keep in mind for our second focus text, uh, chapter 13, that Paul, where Paul gets, has this beautiful poetry, these, this beautiful... Uh, lifting up of the virtue of love. And of course, we very easily don't hear the radical implications in that, uh, especially when we don't consider it in context. We hear it read at, at weddings a lot. It's such a beautiful passage. But it's critical to keep in mind this overall context of the Roman system of wealth, status, and privilege, particularly as it's embodied by access to knowledge or education. So when we read chapter 13, 
we have to keep in mind, for example, uh, earlier in the letter, chapter 8, where Paul uh, contrasts knowledge, which puffs up or makes people arrogant, with love that builds up. So when Paul is extolling all the virtues and qualities of love and claiming that love should be the central ethic of, of the Corinthian community and of any Christ-centered community, he's effectively criticizing any participation by that community community in the Roman system of wealth, status, privilege, and power, right? So it's a very radical statement. And when you, when you read in other places in 1 Corinthians, you realize that Paul's effectively inviting those who have access to privilege within the Roman system, who are members of the church at Corinth, to cut themselves off from those privileges for the sake of their, as he calls them, weaker sisters and brothers, right? So there's this radical new ethic, the love ethic, challenges and criticizes the Roman system of privilege and power, and really any system that accords wealth, status, privilege, and power only to the few. Because the cross has made all that sort of way of thinking about life foolish. And so, especially here in St. Louis, of course, we've been engaged in some very critical and necessary conversations about racial privilege, about white privilege, and I think across the country, we really need to be engaged in these conversations about racial privilege, white privilege, economic privilege, and uh, systems of wealth, status, and power that exist in the United States. And sometimes as the church, you know, we're not sure how to engage these discussions or what resources and faith we can draw on. And in that regards, 1 Corinthians, and especially understanding the radical implications of Paul's love ethic in 1 Corinthians, can be a tremendous resource as we engage these conversations as the church and hope to contribute to dismantling these systems of wealth, status, privilege, and power and replacing them instead with the foolishness of the cross, the foolishness of, of the love ethic that we know in Jesus Christ.